Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We will be discussing the application requirements for the, um, for the Second Chance Acts that we have, solicitations that we have available right now. My name is Keisha Dupree, and I am a program associate at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, where we provide training and technical assistance to all grantees funded under the Federal Second Chance Act. Before we begin, I have a couple of technical notes. If you encounter connection or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. We'll also put that number up on the chat box on your screen. Unfortunately, there are some connection issues we may not be able to resolve during the webinar. However, we are recording today's webinar and it will be posted on our website. You may also check the website directly at nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. We may have time for questions and answers from the audience at the end of the webinar. To ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. You can ask questions at any point during the webinar, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible before we end today. And with that, I will turn it over to Andre Bethia to introduce our speakers and speak a little on the current solicitations available. Thank you, Keisha. Greetings and hello to everyone, to all potential applicants. My name is Andre Bethea. I am the Policy Advisor for Corrections and Reentry here at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is a part of the Office of Justice Programs within the United States Department of Justice. We're really excited that you're joining us for a unique opportunity um, within the Second Chance Act portfolio. Oftentimes, we are trying to encourage uh, new applications from, you know, all around the country and new regions. So we thought it would be helpful to have our partners from George Mason University to join us uh, to really kind of explain what really is, what it entails to actually write a, a proposal that will definitely be worthwhile that represents uh, the needs of your community in a, in, in a strong way that will, you know, warrant um, BJ supporting it. So again, my name is Andre Bathia. I am the policy advisor. Currently within the Second Chance Act portfolio, we have two grant solicitations that are open, two. The first one being Innovations and Supervision Initiative, Building Capacity to Create Safer Communities. A specific webinar for that solicitation is coming up in April 10th. The other solicitation that we have that is open currently is the Second Chance Act Comprehensive Community-Based Adult Reentry Program. That webinar took place on yesterday. However, it will be posted on the National Reentry Resource Center's website, which is www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. And I think it should be on the website definitely by Monday. Again, we are really excited about this unique opportunity. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Faye Taxman and we have Dr. Amy Murphy, both of whom are from the George Mason University and are well-known partners um, in the work of corrections reentry with us here at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. We're grateful to have their expertise and their thought leadership and helping us to convey to potential applicants how to think differently about what it is to have a statement of problem and what are the differences uh, between this, the Second Chance Act portfolios. So I'll pass it on to my uh, wonderful, highly esteemed, I want to say colleagues, but I think of them as uh, definitely thought leaders in this space. So and Dr. Taxman and Dr. Murphy, uh, you can take it from here. Thank you again. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Faye Taxman, and I have Amy Murphy with me. Good afternoon, everyone. So Amy and I are going to basically walk through some of the core components of uh, effective grants. Um, and we actually um, got permission from four or five BJA grantees to use their grant, a piece of their grant as a way of demonstrating core, compo core features of grants that um, got funded. So we thought we'd share with you some tips on how to write effective grants. 
Um, as Andre indicated, BJA has released already two solicitations. I think actually yesterday or the day before, there was another one that was released that was related to the field of community corrections, reentry, um, and working with people in the community. Um, so, you know, you should take a peek at the website from BJA frequently at this time of year so you can learn about new announcements as they occur. Um, okay, so um, in each grant proposal, um, you know, there are priority considerations. And generally what we've done here is we've identified the priority considerations in the innovative supervision um, grantees, the strategies to reduce violent recidivism, and then also in the reentry. And these are really important features because they should help you think about program designs that answer the questions that they're raising here. So the innovative supervision one is designed regarding strategies to reduce violent recidivism. And they're looking to demonstrate how you can identify people who are violent, um, also how you can improve the supervision outcomes of these folks. In the reentry grants, they're also focused in on trying to foc uh, uh, put attention on high-risk individuals that also have a history of violence, um, and they're looking for randomizations or plans for an independent evaluation. Again, each grant has their own nuances, they have their own priorities, and they have their own key components. So pay attention to those up front um, because that can help really shape the design of the um, program that you're doing. So <clears throat> what we want to do now is essentially uh, focus attention on what are some of the core features of winning grants. So those core features, we basically um, focus on the notion of being crisp and clear and concise, all these C's here. Um, and the focus of attention here is to describe your problem, why is it a problem, and what have you tried in your own program or jurisdiction. Another clear component that you need to focus in is the aims of that study that you're doing or the project. What are you trying to accomplish? How is what you're trying to do will accomplish that? The next part is a clear design. In other words, you're going to propose an approach, and how is that approach going to achieve the desired outcome? A fourth component are the steps that you intend to take to put your plan in action. And as a good grant writer, you need to talk about why this design that you're doing is feasible in your jurisdiction. So in other words, the goal here is to build on what you currently have in your organization and build so that you're actually focusing attention on the fact that this is the next developmental phase. Uh, as evaluators, we typically always are concerned about measures, but as you know, program administrators and designers and implementers, you should also be concerned about measures. In other words, how do you know when you're making progress and convince the reader that you know what you're going to measure to, dis, uh, to indicate that you're actually doing the things that you set out in your grant proposal? And an important part, and you'll see this at the end when we talk about some of the requirements of the grant, is that really these grants are take a village to put together and also take a village to actually, um, you know, implement. Part of the requirement for the reentry grant is to include a research partner. We would highly recommend that in any grant proposal, not just because we're researchers, um, but also because it helps to fill out your team and it gives you opportunities to learn more about your program as you move forward. So clarity and crispness here, the reason we uh, focus in is that when you're writing your grant, 
being simple about it, but also being very focused about what your message is, is critically important in a grant um, that tells a story in a way that's very convincing that this is the next stage of development for your particular project. All right, so let's go through some of the requirements of the grant. So these webinar series, there's one today, and then there's another one on Monday afternoon, April 9th. Today we're going to cover three sections of the grant proposal, the background of the problem, the project design, and implementation. On on uh, Monday, we're going to cover capabilities and competencies, your data collection plan, and some, more, um, some comments about the budget for your particular project. Uh, so let's focus attention today on background of the problem. I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Amy Murphy. Thank you, Faith. So the first section that you'll be working on is going to be the background of the problem. And in this section, um, you'll want to really let the reviewers know that you really looked into the problem and you have evidence to demonstrate that it is a problem in your jurisdiction. Uh, this accounts for 15% of the proposal value and you only have four pages to make it clear. So um, what you really want to uh, ensure you include in this section are clearly establishing the problem. So why are you concerned about the problem at hand? Um, what have you tried before and was it successful and is it something that you're trying to build upon or do you want to try another approach? You also want to have very clear aims about what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you also want to look at the significance of the, of the problem. So how is this initiative going to improve outcomes like recidivism uh, or improved health for individuals? So to frame the background of the problem, we want to look at a few things. So why is this the problem that you want to address? And what specific intervention will you use to address the problem? What are the goals and the aims of the project? That is, how does your method address the problem at hand? For example, if you are seeing high rates of recidivism among women with co-occurring substance use and mental health disorders, then you aim to find an appropriate approach to reduce their recidivism. And you need data to support both that this is a problem and that your intervention is appropriate to address that, that problem. Throughout this webinar, we're going to show you some examples of successful grant applications. And here's a snippet from an application that was submitted to BJA last year by the Hidalgo, Texas uh, Department of Community Supervision. And I want to highlight a few things in this problem statement, um, which really clearly outlines the target population for, uh, for what the grant was intending to address. So first, it's really data-driven, and it's a clear statement that emerging adults are showing high rates of recidivism and are a problem for the county. It also defines what is driving some of this group's recidivism high rates of recidivism uh, without, without trying to demonize them in any way. It mentions um, for example, that they have issues with impulsivity and inability to regulate emotions um, and that they're, they're not necessarily through with their cognitive development. Um, it states the significance of the, um, of the problem to wider issues of the criminal justice population. And it also really underscores the unique challenges that this group of people presents for supervision agencies. Um, for example, developing cognitively and socially, and their lack of preparation for independence. And so there are many, many reasons to, t to track and keep quality data records, uh, and writing grants is one of them. So remember that this is a competitive process, and those applicants who have, a strong data, who have strong data to back up their problem statement and action plan are going to have an edge over those who rely on anecdotal evidence. Um, so we're all familiar with the age crime curve, but in this, uh, in this application, Hidalgo County was able to really demonstrate that it was clearly a problem in their jurisdiction. So in this chart, we see that emerging adults who comprise only one third of the population are responsible for nearly half of revocations in the department. 
And you compare that to uh, the, the over 39 crowd who comprise the same percentage of the population uh, but are only 18% of revocations. So with this, you're really able to make your point, prove that you have data, prove that you know how to use data to, to state a problem, uh, and, and it shows that you can also, uh, you'll also look at how you can demonstrate your calculation of recidivism. And you see that it wasn't going to be enough to simply write, we will target the needs of the emerging adult population to reduce recidivism. That is not a clear enough aim. Uh, the agency goes on to state specifically what they are going to do uh, with the funding. Uh, so, uh, so here they describe that they're going to develop specialized curriculum and case management strategies for the emerging adult population. They're going to train the officers on how to better manage this population through specialized caseloads and the specialty court. And they're going to implement this new model of supervision and build on an existing uh, researcher-practitioner partnership, uh, use a random assignment procedure, and, and assess the impact on probationer outcomes. And what they don't do here, because it's still the background section, is to get into the weeds. The actual detail of how they're going to accomplish the actions outlined will be fleshed out in the project design section, as well as in the appendices. All right, um, so Amy has just described the background, which is basically laying the foundation. What is, what is the problem in your jurisdiction, and how are you going to use this particular grant to address that pro problem? The next part of the grant, and really the heart of the grant, is the design of your project. Forty percent of the value of a proposal is basically devoted to design. Um, so here, again, going back to sort of the notion about clear aims, clear design, clear steps, that's all critically important here, and as I said, it's 40% of your proposal. I estimate, you know, that in the 15-page limit of this proposal, that's 15 pages double space, that this, is, or this section should be around 10 pages. Um, obviously, these estimates that Amy and I are giving you about the page length are kind of just a, a guesstimate, uh, but we're doing this really to give you some ideas about how much time and energy to put into different sections of the proposal. So there are three parts of the design sections. One is the aims, the second is the foundation, and the third part is the steps that you're going to take. The important part about the aims is to specify, as Amy showed you with the Hildago County um, proposal, uh, to identify goals and the accomplishments that will actually occur um, as part of your grant proposal. The foundation part is really laying the rationale for this approach. We recommend you emphasize the evidence-based or evidence-informed features of your approach. In other words, go to the research literature, go to crimesolutions.gov um, as a way of basically trying to justify why it is that the approach you're taking is going is sound and why that approach is going to really reduce recidivism. Again, these proposals are, are around reducing violence and also reducing recidivism. So you want to use the evidence-based practices and evidence-based um, <clears throat> treatment and interventions as a way of trying to really integrate within the design that you're offering. Third, and probably the majority of this section, is really devoted to the issue about the steps that you hope to take to, to basically build your program and who in your organization or partner agencies will be involved in building that. So these are the three major parts of this design section. Okay, so under aims and goals and accomplishments, think of this as being very action-oriented. 
So we all know that the general goal is to reduce recidivism, but you just can't say that. You really have to show how the parts of your program are going to be linked to recidivism reduction. So for example, here, we've kind of identified some, you know, some thoughts about this. One might be to provide officer training to develop case plans that address recidivism reduction efforts. You can see this is more specific than just reduce recidivism. Or another aim might be to address violent prone behaviors through the use of violence interrupters to reduce, re, re, reduce recidivism and violence. And third, we want to, and another example might be to develop a violence curriculum that focuses on pro-social behaviors to reduce recidivism. So we can see here that the aims really need to be very action-oriented, but they also tie to the components of the program that you're putting in place. Okay, foundation. As I stated before, the foundation is really important. What type of officer training you do, what type of violent prone behaviors are you going to work on, why are you using violent interrupters, what types of curriculum, all of those need to be founded in the research literature that justifies why your proposed project is based on our current state of knowledge and why you're going to advance that state of knowledge. So there are a lot of resources out there. We've just listed a couple for you to look at the area of research foundation. And those um, sources include crimesolutions.gov, the Cochrane Collaboration, the Campbell Collaboration on Crime and Justice, Systematic Reviews, um, those are synthesis of research findings. So it's important the foundation section is really to specify what your design is and how your design will achieve the goal of reducing recidivism, violence, and for example, opioid use, all hot topics today. Um, and one of the things that's really critical here is that by being specific about why you have the components that you have, you're able to make the case that you have a demonstration project that is likely to be successful. So remember I raised earlier this notion about feasibility as being really important? Well, feasibility can be achieved by being very specific about the foundation that builds your particular project. A good aspect of the foundation um, is to really focus on research practitioner partnerships. So I'm going to turn this over to Amy and she's going to discuss partnerships. Thank you. So, you know, as researchers, we would really be remiss if we didn't emphasize the benefit of, of the research practitioner partnership. And there's a strong emphasis on making projects data-driven, and your research partner can be a critical piece of this. Now, it's not, requ it's not required in all of the grants, um, but, so you should carefully review the grant to see whether or not it's required. Um, but it is considered a good resource, and it's considered something that would strengthen your proposal. Um, especially having, the, uh, having them as an evaluator on the project. Um, and there's also evidence that shows that the presence of an evaluator can help improve both the implementation and the outcomes of a project. And really the partnership can serve as a foundation for your grant. You're going to want to engage a research partner as early in the process as possible because they can help you with the first step, which is putting together the grant application. So the traditional research model tends to treat researchers as outsiders in the problem-solving process. Often they're, they're serving merely as observers and evaluators, um, keeping a minimal role until after the fact uh, when you're looking at the data to evaluate whether or not the program was successful. Um, but a research partner can be so much more. When we say action research, we mean that the researcher takes an active role 
uh, from start to finish, providing feedback and input on the project design and implementation and ensuring that the interventions are evidence-based. And then, of course, uh, they would follow throughout the, throughout the grant process uh, and, uh, and help you with your evaluation. Uh, would, they would be con collecting data throughout uh, and feeding that back to you uh, to help you improve processes and, and to ultimately inform the evaluation of the project, which, um, when, when you show positive effects, can help lead to further grants. So here are some of the ways a research partner can help develop and implement your project. So problem analysis, the research partner can help you look at what is the evidence that this is the specific problem and help you really drill down to, uh, to clearly define the, the problem. Um, identification, so a good re identification of evidence informs strategies and interventions. So a good research partner is constantly reading and staying abreast of the evidence informed and evidence based practices, as well as promising innovations in the field. This can really help you build an, inter an evidence in informed intervention. Um, the most traditional role that a research partner tends to have is looking at the process and outcomes evaluation. Uh, but it, they can also be used for ongoing monitoring and feedback. So many agencies and organizations are busy managing the day-to-day -day aspects of the grant and working directly with clients, um, so they don't necessarily have the time or the capacity to monitor data. So as issues crop up, uh, the, the researcher may be the one who's able to identify those uh, in the process and help the, uh, help the agency or organization address the issues. So the key word here is partnership. Your action research partner will not simply show up two years after your project ends and tell you whether it worked or not. Uh, what they will do is have an active ongoing partnership with you. They're, they will use the research process to help you solve local problems, and in doing so, uh, that's going to include data collection uh, to help you understand and identify the problems, uh, strategic analysis to help develop targeted interventions, monitoring the program and providing feedback for refinement um, as you go through the life of the grant, and ultimately, of course, assessing the impact that your program has. So there is a really a growing body of evidence that shows that data-driven approaches with a strong emphasis on the quality of implementation makes for more effective interventions, and the research partner is going to be key to this. They're going to assist you uh, in the initial gathering of data as well as gathering data throughout the process. Uh, they'll help you with synthesizing information and evaluating the strategies that you're using uh, to uh, to implement your project uh, in case you need to correct course at some point during the project. Um, again, it's an extra set of eyes, an objective set of eyes uh, that uh, is observing the project. Um, there are a neutral partner uh, coming in with unbiased perspectives. Uh, so really their interest is in helping you make your project as successful as possible, um, but also uh, monitoring it and, uh, and providing an objective evaluation and they're going to offer expertise to you in areas that are not necessarily available. Um, they may have access to different resources than you do, um, for example, uh, LexisNexis or other, um, other online libraries. Um, they may be very skilled in statistical analyses. Um, and really, you want to uh, make sure you engage the research partner in, as early in the process as possible. Um, because one, that's going to help you, uh, help you develop your plan, but it also helps really solidify the relationship. Um, and, and it can help you with forming uh, ideas for, for your grant. So these are some of the skills that an action research partner should bring to the project. When you're choosing a research partner, you want to consider more than just proximity. Are they, are they located close to me? Um, or, have, or whether you've worked with them before, uh, you really want to be able to drill down and, and identify a researcher that has these skills. Um, because we all know that, um, you know, act, uh, 
action research is an emerging area, and uh, so many uh, many people who are, are are used to just having the evaluator role uh, rather than having a, a really active role in the project. So the things you're going to look for is that the researcher will have a commitment to the project and to problem solving with you. They will have knowledge of the criminal justice system, specifically your local criminal justice system, uh, as well as the specific topic that you're working on. Uh, they will have the ability to communicate and advise. So you don't want someone who's just dictating to you. You want there to be a back and forth exchange of information, a really clear communication channel. Uh, you're looking for a partner who has the ability to look at a problem creatively and perhaps help you come up with, uh, with interventions or solutions that you may not have thought of. Uh, you also want someone who has familiarity with and, and someone who values a broad array of research methodology, methodologies. Uh, so that would include both, both qualitative, both the number crunching, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, the quantitative, the number crunching, uh, and qualitative, so, uh, so looking at process measures as well as outcomes measures. And uh, you want someone who has a willingness to work with the unique characteristics of criminal justice data and perhaps some non-traditional creative research methodologies. Uh, I don't need to tell anyone who's on the line that oftentimes working with criminal justice data means pulling from, from 10 different data sets, uh, none of which talk to each other and all of which have different variables. So you want someone who has a level of comfortability with uh, withdrawing from multiple data sets. And um, perhaps most importantly, you're going to want someone who has the ability to meet short deadlines. Um, and finally, uh, both the lead agency or organization and the researchers need to know how to be good partners. Um, they should come to meetings and be on calls. They should not dictate what to do based on what the data say, um, but rather share the data as a means to start or enhance the, the conversation. Um, they should be helping you make informed decisions with the data, uh, working with you in a true collaboration, um, working to, to educate uh, other partners and be an advocate for improvement. So, uh, so not simply handing you a, a big data file uh, or some, some SPSS output, uh, rather they should be uh, coming up with, with different ways to engage you with the data and, and showing you what the data are really saying. Um, you want to make sure that you uh, include uh, the research collaborator in meetings. Uh, you want to, when you're, when you're convening your project team, you want the research partner to be part of those. Uh, and the research partner will also help you to uh, bring uh, department concerns and perspectives to the team. Uh, in addition to good partnerships, uh, you would want to be sharing data and information. And of course, uh, what is most key in developing good partnerships is listening, responding, and being flexible and creative. And with that, I will hand it back over to Dr. Taxman. All right, so I hope everyone might want to get up for a second and take a stretch um, because we are actually now going to plunge into some of the steps and design aspects. Um, so we're going to be pretty technical here, um, but it's a, we're hoping to give you some ideas about things that you may want to include in your proposal. All right. Uh, so first, I want to draw your attention to a document that you can get off of the website of CSG. I, you have a link right there. And the purpose of this document is to identify some process measures that you could use to demonstrate progress that you make in your particular jurisdiction as a result of the efforts that you are proposing. So these process measures are useful in, to, in order to be able to better understand how well your project has helped address the problem that you've identified. This particular document was designed to talk about the interface <clears throat> between justice and behavioral health. Um, but really, it's very, much more valuable than that. It has a lot of really good secrets enclosed. So essentially, there are four types of measures that we recommend 
<coughs> sorry, that you consider for your particular jurisdiction. One is description of the population you're going to serve. The second one is process measures, the key components of your program, what activities are involved, how much do people participate, what are some of the system features. The third part are implementation issues relating to staff opinions and perspectives, fidelity of the core components, and how it impacts the system. And the fourth part are outcomes. These usually take longer periods of time to achieve, such as reducing drug use, reducing violent behavior, reducing recidivism. Um, and a lot of times people in their grant proposals, they really focus in, okay, we're going to measure outcomes. Um, but let's face it, it takes a long time to be able to measure outcomes well. If you work with your research partner, they'll be able to kind of talk you through that. Um, but Building in some of the process measures and implementation measures can really help your grant proposal to better describe what you're trying to accomplish, but also how are you going to know when you've gotten to some of those finishing lines. Uh, so within the document, we talk about four types of process measures. One has to do with system level issues about using assessment and referral systems. Um, so screening rates, clinical assessment rates, referral to programs and services, and the big one, initiation. So I, I'll be perfectly honest with you, initiation um, to me is one of the biggest indicators uh, that we need more information about in terms of how programs work. So it's, you know, a lot of programs assess people, but then the question is, do people show up for their first a meeting? Do they show up for their first sessions? Um, and so initiation rates are really designed to be able to look at show up rates. The second set of measures have to do with engagement and completion. Again, these are areas in which very few studies um, or projects actually focus attention on, but they're very valuable. So engagement here refers to whether or not the person is actively attending your project, whatever it is. The reason engagement is very important is because if people don't show up, they're not likely to make much progress. Um, and so, you know, being able to report on engagement measures um, is really critically important in, in able to show that your project is making um, some headway in terms of helping people to change their behaviors. Retention has to do with people being involved in programs for a longer period of time. Successful completion has to do with, you know, completing a component of the program. And then we have um, attendance to other issues like use of medically assisted treatments, compliant with treatment case uh, plans. All of these measures, these two sets of measures, are critical process measures that really can be integrated within your design and you can also use them to basically look at how well are you doing in terms of making progress in terms of implementing your particular project. Set three of the process measures have to do with recovery management, and that has to do with the use of a continuum of care and transitioning people from one level of service to another. And the fourth set has to do with improvements in the systems, use of uniform um, screening protocols, ensuring people have insurance, um, and being cognizant of responsivity rates, being cognizant of availability of programming, access rates, and participation rates. So these different measures, again, can be integrated. So a lot of grantees oftentimes have difficulty proving the case that they actually can make headway on recidivism. And by including these measures, you're able to demonstrate to people that you've got enough in place 
and you're going to measure the, you know, the steps that clients have to take to be involved in your initiative, um, and that can be very beneficial in sort of proving the case that you have the ability to really implement this particular program or project that you're working on. Okay, so let's get a little bit more into the steps. Um, so if you remember, you know, the steps are really the detailed description about what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and what are the different components. So implementation is really the name of the game in BJA projects. It's all about fine implementation to really put in place those components that are going to reduce violence and reduce recidivism. And an important part, and this is part of one of your mandated appendices, is to establish a time frame. Another important part, and I highly recommend this, is to really outline the steps you're going to take to implement your project. So oftentimes there are initial steps the jurisdictions have to go through, writing SOPs, doing contracts, hiring personnel, going through your county, council, or state government to get an appropriation. All of these things need to be outlined and put into the timeline for getting your project up and running. The next part is what the core design of your project is. Um, and you can outline, and we'll go in, in more detail what that should include. Another part is the feedback measures, those process measures that I just went over, um, using those process measures as a way of garnering whether or not you're making um, headway in terms of putting this program in place. And then efforts you're going to use to refine and modify the program based upon those process measures, as well as the concept of sustainability or keeping the program that works well in place after grant funding is over. So BJA would like information about all of these different five components. What you're really doing in these five components is filling in the black box of essentially looking at what the clients are that you are going to be working with, what are some of the quality indicators that you're going to be focused in, how are you going to address organizational culture, because all those will affect your programming and they will affect also the outcomes that you're trying to accomplish as part of this. So think about your program design as being unveiling the black box so that we really know what's going on within this particular grant and what you're trying to accomplish. So the pillars of design fall into the following categories. One is target population, the other is core features, and the uh, third part is staffing. And within each of these components, there are other components um, for you to describe as part of your grant proposal. And this is what we're going to spend the rest of this webinar on, is focusing our attention on what we, what's useful for you to include in your proposal. <clears throat> so target population. It's really important to identify the inclusion and exclusion criteria and to justify why you are including the population that you are. We recommend that you really focus your attention on linking to the aims, the problem that you're trying to solve, and also linking to the desired outcomes that you're trying to achieve. We also recommend you identify why certain people would not be eligible um, for your particular program. And finally, we recommend that you discuss what screening assessment process you are going to need to identify the population. Screening assessment here might be what tools you have in place, who in your organization will actually do this. Um, but being very clear about the target population is critically important. Essentially here, some guide points are, is that you should really focus your attention on eligibility criteria versus willingness to participate versus actually people who do participate. 
So in your description, you need to look at the issues about how you are garnering that target population. So these grants are about reducing violence. Um, therefore, it serves reasonable to expect that you're going to be serving clients who are, have some violent tendencies. Um, now you will have to define what that means. Uh, another factor that we know in in terms of effectiveness is that criminal justice risk level affects outcomes, and those outcomes actually include lowering, um, low risk people tend not to do as well as high risk people. Um, criminal justice risk and type of criminogenic needs also affect outcomes. So there's different types of people that are more likely to be successful in your program, and this you can find out through the research literature than others. Age and developmental issues should be considered, comorbid conditions, and then ability to access the program. So if you're in a rural county and you only have one service provider, and that service provider is 90 miles away from where most people that you're drawing from live, Think about that access issue as either a target population issue or a design issue. Another core component that you should think about um, is the core features of your project. So in the world of science, we use a concept called mechanisms of action. Mechanisms of action, it's kind of techy, uh, but what it really does is it really focuses your attention on what must be in place to facilitate that behavior change. What are you actually doing that's going to facilitate that change? So if you remember, one of the aims that we identified was the use of violence interrupters as a way of trying to really reduce violent recidivism. So violent interrupters is a specific type of program and service. Um, it's affiliated with the Cure Violence Initiatives or some of the ceasefire or uh, focused deterrence efforts in which you use people who have prior histories, um, who know how to work with people um, who are involved in violence, and they actually um, can relate and can also navigate and help the person move from a state of which they're involved in violent type behavior into a state in which they're involved in more pro-social behaviors. So your design and core features basically need to discuss what it is you're trying to do, what's the best option for your agency, and how does this build on current efforts. We lay the current efforts out there as something to consider because that's important for sustainability, keeping this initiative going when grant funds end. So components of the demonstration project need to be about what's inside the black box, what are some of the curriculums and processes that you use, and all of those need to be specified in your, um, in your grant proposal. All right, so let's pay a little bit, um, move on to looking at some of these core components. So again, we're borrowing from another successful grantee, um, the County of Camden, and here they are defining dosage. So dosage. Hello, does someone have a question? I think we just had a little bit of feedback, but I um, muted them. Okay, thank you. All right, so dosage refers to the amount of clinical hours that someone is involved in. And as the county of um, Camden basically identified here, they want to identify high risk and moderate risk people who will receive priority for participation, and they will place the high risk and high need clients in a minimum of three hours of treatment and intervention, and they will place people who are moderate risk in a minimum of two hours, and those who are low risk in a minimum of 100 hours. So this is sort of one of the recommended evidence-informed practices 
<clears throat> but here you see that they're very cognizant of this and they demonstrate to the reader that they know the literature and they're going to put that in place um, within their particular initiative. Um, Father Matters is another um, grantee, successful grantee, um, and they're here describing their implementation steps. So they basically provide some services in jail, and then they will build on those relationships and experiences to provide services to people when they leave the jail. Um, so the program takes place in facilities um, where they actually can bring in peer navigators and work with participants both on pre-release efforts, but also work with their probation officer and parole officers on official reentry plans. This narrative describes how they're going to have impact with the clients. They also talk about eligibility criteria and the process that they're going to work with the clients. They're going to have an information session that will be held weekly. That's being very detailed, but it tells the story of how they're actually going to work with the client. They then talk about how they're going to collect information and they're going to complete a risk and needs assessment tool. Um, and, and then they build in the type of research study that they're going to do by randomly assigning people to an intervention or control group using some sort of blind randomized procedure that their outside evaluator will use. So you can see the level of detail here. It's very clear what they're doing. It also describes for you the program, but how the research is actually going to work within that program. Staffing is another core component. Again, um, borrowing from the County of Camden, essentially we, they outline how they're going to staff their correctional facility that is going to operate their co-occurring reentry project. Um, they identify people who are going to run the project. They identify what they're going to do during this 36 month of the grant. And they're going to talk about, and they identify how the staff will be an integral part of this new initiative. So they're telling you how much staffing they're going to do, who's going to do what, and how they're actually going to um, participate in running the program. This is a high level of detail that's really critically important. Um, and it gives you more information about the particular project and narrative. Okay, going back to my geeky term, mechanism of action. So here, mechanism of action actually has to do with what is the program design going to be. Now, in this particular um, paragraph, they talk about what happens typically, and that's going to be part of the control group. But then they move into the notion of essentially how they're going to implement a gender-specific community reintegration plan and process. And they show you how they're going to use um, video conferencing, personalized case plans, a review of a specific um, you know, instrument, in this case the SPIN, um, a supply of gender specific resources that they're going to incorporate as well as transportation um, assistance. So what they are doing here is they're really describing what is their gender specific services and what are they doing that's different than standard practice. And the mechanism of action is identified by this level of detail where they're really helping us better understand what gender specific programming is going to look like. Here's another example of a mechanism of action, this one talking about an incentive. So in this particular project, again, this is our Hidalgo County project, um, they, will, they talk about using a, an incentive sanction matrix and they'll use surf, swift and certain behavior responses. They describe how the officer will supervise the client how they'll give them points for compliant behavior, and how they'll allow the uh, client to accumulate points quickly. 
essentially what they're doing is they're describing implementation, but they're also telling you about the features of their particular program and how they are going to meet the criteria. This was for a SWIFT and certain application, and so they were really describing swiftness and certainty for you. Some other things that you may want to consider um, is that basically in your implementation section, you may want to identify the different types of manualized treatments and workbooks that you might want to do and the research foundations for those. You may want to look at how your program varies from some of the research foundations so that you can talk about why you included the components that you did. Um, you may want to basically look at issues related to stages of change or talk about how you're going to build program quality. Some new ideas um, based upon the current literature is you may want to look at desistance approaches, um, deal with ethnic and racial socialization factors, um, avoid some of the genderized version of criminal cells that occur in treatment programs, integrate developmental science, and deal with some of the coerced mobility or PTSD issues that occur within the justice population. And these are important because they actually relate to some of the core components related to violence. So we wouldn't be remiss uh, we would be remiss, actually, if we didn't talk about the challenges that grantees often face. Um, and what I would suggest is you consider this list of challenges um, in, in terms of thinking through what are some of the things you need to address. So we provided this list, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are typical problems that grantees have. Many programs do not use the full curriculum. Many programs take shortcuts and quality assurance. Many programs have um, staffing issues. Many programs don't um, dilute the core components of their programs. Uh, a lot of programs lack clarity regarding completion issues. A lot of programs lack clarity regarding how they're going to deal with noncompliance. And finally, sharing of information is not always um, facilitated. Another area for you to consider, um, and I know we're getting short on time, is that basically you should identify the staffing and leadership. And because we are getting short on time, um, I'm, I'm actually going to go, uh, we'll go over this in a little bit more detail on Monday. Um, but you need to, in your grant proposal, identify what, who is responsible for the project, how, it's how that person is linked to the design, and then the uh, elements that you're going to do to develop your staff and train your staff. Finally, you've heard this many times throughout any of my presentation. Sustainability is key. Thinking about a program that fits within your environment is critically important, and helping the reader to understand that you've selected the features that you have because it will work in your setting. This is something that a lot of people don't really talk about, and yet it's critically important. And oftentimes if you're reviewing proposals, you're oftentimes basically saying, how is this person ever going to do this? Um, so in conclusion, we want you to remember that every grant has requirements. Make sure you know what's covered in the grant proposal. Make sure you know the length. BJA has a request that you number your pages and that they have specifications on font size and margins for your proposal. They also have a list of appendices that are mandated as part of this particular proposal. Um, and the mandated parts are, have to do with the timeline, letters of support, how you're going to measure recidivism, definition of um, key positions, resumes for key staff, example of prior work, and any other um, pending grant applications 
that the applicant has. So today what we tried to do is cover two of the major components of a grant. Um, collectively, they are worth 55% of your grant proposal. So you need a strong background and you also need a strong design area. On Monday, when we have a continuation of this webinar, we will cover the other 45% of the points um, to give you an opportunity. So I know that we only have a few minutes left, but if there are any questions, um, please um, write them in the chat box and we'll be happy to answer the questions. Hi, Faye. We have a few, I don't know if we have a time to at least get to one question. There were a few questions around research partners, um, and that being, how would you recommend to practitioners um, the best way to find a research partner? So, um, I, I think that the, one of the best ways of finding a research partner is to basically go to your local university and go to a social work, criminology, sociology, anthropology um, department. Public health also is another area. And see who's doing work within that particular, uh, you know, arena. Um, and what I would basically See if your partner, uh, to me, a good research partner is someone who's willing to talk through some ideas about the grant proposal before you actually submit them. Um, and they can actually help you think through some of the material. It's a good way to sort of vet a uh, research partner. You want another question you want to? I don't know, we're already over three. I don't know if we want to take any more time. Why don't you do one more question? Okay, no problem. Um, so let me look through here. Let's see. This is also, uh, again, about research partners. Um, what percentage, and you may not know, but what percentage of grant funding would you recommend they set aside for a research partner? Well, I, I think, so a lot of that has to do with the role of the research partner, but essentially I would recommend between, between 10 and 20 percent. Um, in the past, you know, a decade ago, BJA used to have a cap on how much um, they could spend, um, and that may be something that Andre could actually answer um, if he's still on the line. Hi, Faye. Yes, I'm still on the line. We try to encourage um, potential applicants to think about their jurisdiction, right, um, where they're situated, and really just the kind of the, what kind of program or effort are they trying to get across, and how much um, the researcher will have active involvement. And we're encouraging. Um, where as much as feasible as possible to have the researcher um, not just be a part of the evaluation design, but play that role to walk through um, what the trajectory you know will look like for um, and for the clients and for the overall shape of what the programmatic effort will be. So while we no longer have the cap, I think I will stand by your 10 through 20 percent, uh, considering the three years uh, that a program will usually operate should be um, earmarked for researchers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of variables that, to go into that e equation, but, you know, I mean, you know, having a partnership uh, means sharing, and the researcher is going to be doing a lot of important work here. I mean, if you take some of the recommendations for some of the measures, uh, those aren't necessarily easy measures to calculate, uh, but a good researcher should be able to do that. And those measures are things that you want to be calculated frequently within your project so you can see how well things are going. Any other? Yes, there's one more. Let me get through this. So this is around 
access and systematic responsivity measures, and just wanting to know what are some examples of those items in the context of a reentry program that you may be able to provide. Do you want to repeat the question? Sorry. Mm -hmm. What are some examples of access or systematic responsivity measures in the context of a reentry program? So access measures have to do with how easy is it for get someone to get into a program. So if you have a typical programs that have wait lists that are, you know, are five months or four months long, um, those are programs where access is very limited. Um, in terms of responsivity measures, I mean, what you want to be able to do is to ensure that your jurisdiction or program can meet the needs of the clients. Um, and, uh, you know, as many people are probably well aware, you know, we have um, on our website at uh, George Mason University, we have a, the risk needs responsivity tool that people can use to basically calculate some of the responsivity rates um, of whether and as based on the characteristics of their clients. Um, and, you know, we recommend that you look at, you know, is your program able to meet the criminogenic or criminal thinking uh, needs of your clients? Are your programs able to meet some of the self-management issues of your clients? Are your, you know, is your jurisdiction or program able to provide um, some of the employment training that's, um, that is needed oftentimes? Uh, so, you know, those are some examples. If you actually go to the CSG um, uh, document that I referenced here, um, that document describes the measures in detail and also gives calculations, how to calculate them. Thank you. Those are all of the questions that we have. But I just wanted to remind everyone, if you're interested in the second portion of the webinar, you can find that at csgjusticecenter.org under resources and webinars. You'll be able to register for the second portion there. I wanted to also just thank Faye and Amy and Andre um, Bathia for coming on and helping us walk through this process of responding to the solicitations that are available. And if you have any additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me. My information is on the webinar registration page um, available to you. Thank you. Yeah, all. we can we can answer some of the questions and then give them back to you, Keisha, and you, know, you can post them someplace. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Thank you all. Okay. Well, have a Thank great you. day, everyone. Thanks for joining day. us today.